Good morning. morning. Welcome to Manhattan Beach Community Church. No matter who you are and where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. You may not recall, but my name is Mark Pettis, and I am the senior minister here at MBCC, and it is my privilege to serve with this congregation, and I am just returning from the second half of a sabbatical. And so, um, and there's some things that have changed since I left. It's exciting things. I'm looking forward to seeing how all those come out. But it is very nice to be back with you. I'm excited to be back and ready to kind of head into this next program year. I, am, I welcome you this morning on behalf of myself, on behalf of our worship assistant, Lance Honey, and our associate minister, Reverend Matthew Baugh, who has been holding down the fort while I've been gone. And let's see, I, I almost have, I, have, I don't know what's going on much because I've only been back for a couple days. I do know that unless they move them, we have blue pew books on the inside edges of our pews and I'd invite you to find those and sign those and send them down to the edges and bring them back to the middle. Um, also, um, I want to mention that... Um, what else did I want to mention? I think Lance is going to get the one thing that I was thinking about. And, um, oh, I wanted to mention this. the flowers on our chancel this morning are flowers from a memorial service we had here yesterday for Bob Homan. And so we thank his family for um, allowing us to continue to display the flowers this morning. And we continue to remember Bob and his family as we um, move forward. And so with that, I don't... I could tell you all about my sabbatical, but that just seems like something I could do in sermons for like the next couple months, which is much better for me. So at this point, I'll invite Lance to do our congregational currents. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back, Mark. Although uh, Matthew and others have done a wonderful job, um, it is great to have you back, and you've been very missed. So. Um, it's great to see you. Um, so speaking of summer, I recently came back from a visit uh, from my in-laws. And um, in particular, um, my mother-in-law in New Jersey, she has this family prayer that she likes to do and uh, at dinner time. It says, thank you, God, for lovely days and family and friends and time to play, which is very summery. Uh, we do it year round, but, uh, but I think it, it sounds very summery. And um, just want to, speaking of, her birthday is tomorrow, so uh, happy birthday. Um, you might know Victoria Shima if you're um, a Facebook or Instagram follower. Um, she's our number one fan. She's a very enthusiastic follower of all posts. So I think it would be great if we gave her a shout out for her birthday uh, tomorrow. Um, so uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, take a look at your congregational currents if this is the first time here. Um, we have a new a newcomer's table um, out at the front of the sanctuary and we um, welcome you to um, meet the people who can tell you about uh, our church, uh, about all of the, the ways that we can welcome you into our family here. Um, we also have coffee hour after church and we welcome you to come down um, and visit with us and, and get to know some of the people here. So um, uh, a couple things on the bulletin. Um, the uh, ADG has an interesting topic on gene editing to create healthy, healthier babies. Um, um, obviously, there are uh, pros and cons and a uh, very controversial topic um, on both sides. Um, so hopefully you can join that next Sunday. And um, we are doing a blessing of the backpacks and donation on August 18th. Um, so I think we're all set on backpacks, but we still need 15 water bottles. Um, so if there's anybody that can help out with that, we'd greatly appreciate it. We um, have the theater board is working on rehearsals this fall for our fall production of Bus Stop. Um, so please contact Bob Manning about that. We have um, high school summer production that is, um, tickets are gonna be on sale. Uh, at coffee hour, um, tickets are ten dollars. Uh, is three a series of three one-act plays, and um, 
Hopefully you guys will be able to come. That takes place on August 17th, um, so coming up shortly here. And um, uh, oh, Christian education. So we have had um, a series where members of the congregation have uh, talked about an interesting, um, uh, so, something interesting of science, uh, maybe uh, of what they do for a living and career, and are sharing that. Uh, with our children and as a result um, our younger members are getting to meet our older members and there's a lot of education that's happening and it's been such a hit that we are going to continue that on uh, for the first Sunday uh, or one Sunday a month um, throughout the fall um, and there are dates available on the bulletin so take a look at that um, and that's all I have for congregational parents. Okay. okay. I noticed one thing that, that when Lance started off by talking about his in-laws, he said he went to visit his in-laws and kind of smiled at that, and there was a kind of a chuckling in the sanctuary. And I just find that interesting. I just thought I'd point that out. Whenever I talk about visiting my in-laws, people laugh a little too. I don't understand why at all. Each Sunday, we gather to worship. We gather to be in community together, to reconcile ourselves with God, through the act of worship, through music, through prayer, through the gathering of community. But we first begin by reconciling with one another. And in our congregation, we do that through the tradition of passing the peace. And so at this time, I invite us to stand and greet those around us with a word of peace. Please join me in our call to worship. We may be tempted to keep our faith quiet. We may be tempted to hide our motivations. We may be tempted to make our faith a Sunday only endeavor. Dear God, as you hear too many times, we pray for the victims of Dayton and El Paso and Gilroy. We pray for their families. We pray for you to help rid our country and world of this pain and of this hatred and replace it with love. With great faith, we pray for your light to shine bright and see us through the end of this dark tunnel. And now, will you please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father,
And our scripture reading today is from the book of Luke, verse 32 through 40, if you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you king the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also.
Thank you very much. It was lovely. Wow. At this time, I would like to invite the children up for a few moments. Come on. Hi. What's up, Pluto? Okay. Good morning. How are we all doing? So I haven't been around for about two months. I was on what we call a sabbatical. Um, and um, so I did a bunch of different things on that sabbatical. And I'm just wondering what kinds of things y'all have been doing this summer. Anything fun? Any family visits? Family visits? Yeah? How about, you're on a family visit right now. I know. I know, I know your dad. I know your dad. Yeah, yeah, I know. And anyone do any camp type stuff? Go to camp or anything? Any sort of camps? Camps? Camp-ish? Okay, what about uh, sports? Any sports stuff this summer? Even swimming. Swimming? Any swimming? Not you, but your brother. Yeah, yeah, a little swimming, a little swimming. Yeah? All right, all right. Fun stuff? Having fun, though, right? And still a couple weeks till school starts, so that's good, right? Yeah? Ten days, he's got the countdown. All right. So I have some things I want to show you. So you're going to have to get a little closer. The three in the back come a little bit closer. I've got these things. Okay. I think I have six of them. All right, they're not very big, are they? Do we know what they are? Commas. 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 Okay, they're all in their lapel pins is what they are. I have one on right now. And they're different colors or colors. There's a red one, a black one, kind of a blue one, silver. This is a rainbow one and a different rainbow one. Different kinds of commas. Now, why on earth would someone wear a comma? On their, sh on their jacket. Any, any ideas? Any ideas whatsoever? This might be an interesting commentary on the preacher's children of the UCC. Half of them are. Okay. So, the comma is something that in our church denomination, which is the United Church of Christ, we have this symbol we wear. And we wear it because there's this quote. Okay? I'll tell you about this quote. And this woman by the name of Gracie Allen. Funny and very wise woman, okay? And one day, she said, back it up, was, what she said was, never place a period where God has placed a comma. What's that sound like? Is that interesting? Kind of an interesting thought? And the idea is that we often think that things are done. Something is happening, and it finishes, and that's it, and there's never going to be anything again like that. And yet, things continue to happen in our world. And in particular, we think about things like the Bible. The Bible is God's revelation to us through some peop from very special people a long time ago. And God spoke to us through the Bible. And God speaks spoken to us throughout history. And this idea of the com comma, please do not get on my back at this time. Let me just sit down. The idea of the comma is that we believe that God still speaks today in our world. That God speaks through communities like this. God speaks through individual people like you. God speaks in nature. There's lots of different ways we can listen and see where God is still acting and speaking in our world. And so we, because we believe that God never stopped, right? And so what we do is we wear this symbol sometimes to remind us that God is still speaking and to remind us to keep listening for the ways that God is speaking to us in the world. Does that make sense? A little bit? All right, well, let's have a prayer and then we'll head off to Sunday fun day. So let's do that. And you may join us in prayer if you'd like. God, we thank you for continuing to speak to us each day through the world around us and through the people in our lives and in our hearts. 
We thank you for all the special, special words you share with us. And we thank you for loving us so much that you continue to speak to us always. And all of God's children said, Amen. All right. Have fun and Sunday fun days. some wonderful things about having an affectionate child <laughs> and an extroverted child and there's some interesting moments when those two things come together in big ways I've been, I've been with him for seven weeks he couldn't possibly have missed me <laughs> I guess as we prepare ourselves for a time of prayer together as a community I invite us to pause and take a few deep breaths and to center ourselves in this time. And as we come into this time of prayer, we remember that there are many for whom we pray. As part of the ecumenical prayer cycle and in the wider world, we pray for the people of Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. In our nation, we pray for those victimized by violence in El Paso and in Dayton and in Gilroy. We pray for our nation to find ways to prevent such acts in the future. We pray for our leaders to come together to act guided by wisdom and compassion for all people. And in our church community, we pray for Caroline and Charlotte. We pray for Darlene. We pray for Steve and the family of Bob Homan. And I would invite those who wish to share a prayer concern with their voice that is on their heart to do so at this time. We join me in an attitude of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come before you gathered in this community of faith seeking to hear your voice, seeking to experience your love, offering our thanks for all we have received. Draw near to us, O God. Reassure us once again of the love we have. Encourage us once again to share. Hear the names that we have named with our voices and the names that remain on our hearts, bringing a sense of healing to those in need. Hear the cries from the victims of violence. Comfort those who have lost. And remind us that it is within our power to make the changes necessary so that losses like these might end. Strengthen us to find solutions. Encourage us to conversation. Support us 
as we walk through difficult times. And in this time, help us to find the reasons for joy, be they beautiful music shared, the energy and enthusiasm of children, or the beauty of the world in which we live. Help us to experience the joys of life so that we might have the strength to take on the challenges that we face. We pray all of this, O God, in your most holy name. Amen. So, ooh, as I was preparing for this sermon, I was, I was caught by not only the part of passage that, 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 look, that Lance read, but also the following uh, piece in the passage that talks about watchful slaves in our Bible. And I'd like to share that with you at this time. For the passage continues, Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. So all of that oddly got me thinking about the fact that we all have our own style when it comes to getting things done. If you're not sure about what your personal style is, I am sure you can find an online quiz that will help you understand it. Otherwise, ask someone close to you, a family or a friend, because I am certain they can tell you what your style is, especially if it differs from theirs. Some among us are planners. We do our very best to get way out ahead of things. We know what is coming and we know the best way to handle whatever it is so that we will be able to properly plan for it. The to-do lists we have may be mental or they may be physical to-do lists, but you can be darn sure we have them. And you can also be sure that things get done, and often with time to spare so that we can take on the next task. Others, of course, are not planners. These are also people who know there is something that needs doing. Like the planners, they even usually know way ahead of time. Yet despite their foreknowledge, they wait. Perhaps they are in the process of getting other things done or do not have the bandwidth to plan. Perhaps it's just not in their DNA. They tend to, as we say, fly by the seat of their pants and more often than not they get it all done, impressing everyone along the way. And simultaneously it drives the planners among us crazy. I'm just wondering, can you tell which of these I am? <laughs> Regardless of which camp you fall into, which we all live our lives to some extent defined by the things that we have to accomplish, the things on our to-do lists, and we fill our days with the tasks that move us toward getting all of the stuff done. And my friends, this pattern plays out in virtually every aspect of our lives, home, work, school, even in well-planned and sometimes spontaneous vacations. And yet I would suggest boldly, perhaps, that this is not to be the case for our faith. For, and this is where I'm making my bold claim, there is nothing for us to accomplish when it comes to our faith. To be certain, we are a goal-driven society. 
We set goals for ourselves and we often set goals for others. We set goals for our daily lives and we set goals with our leisure activities. As I made my way through the most recent time period of my sabbatical, one of the things that started to become clear to me was that I lack hobbies. If you ask my wife Elena, she will tell you that this is a problem for her. <laughs> So as I chose my activities, I began to see how this time away from daily work might help me find or even rediscover some leisure activities for my life. She was pleased. If you followed my Facebook posts, you already know that the two primary and ongoing leisure activities in which I engaged were guitar lessons and tennis lessons. I did, so, I did do some improv workshops, but that was something I'm kind of keeping to the sabbatical time and not continuing to do at this point. One of the ongoing activities, guitar, is a new endeavor for me, while tennis is something I return to after about a decade away from the sport. And friends, both, like most of our leisure activities, involve setting and attempting to attain goals. To be sure, I do not want my guitar playing to peak with a successful transition from the A to the G chord. I am told that this is an important tool, but I want to learn to play actual songs one day. And with tennis, I seek to know more than just the, the proper form for the strokes, as I strive to become a better player so that I can continue to play for years to come. And of course, in my professional life, I set goals. Some are daily goals, others are more long range. Some are goals I set for myself, while others are goals set for those I supervise. And still others are goals that we set for this congregation. So yes, I do acknowledge that in the realm of religion and in religious institutions, there are plans and goals, tasks, and to-do lists. Without them as a church, we would lack direction. But again, I would say there is nothing specifically to accomplish in our faith. I would even say that going to church for worship is not a task to be accomplished, something to check off the list. Instead, even church attendance, like other ways we may engage our faith, simply demonstrate an intentionality as we seek to make faith a priority in our lives. The passage we heard this morning on the surface might offer a perspective that seems to disagree with me. We might find within what seems to be a call to set and accomplish goals for your faith. But as we probe deeper into the text, I think we find something else at its core, something in fact that supports my assertion. Oddly enough, the first portion of the passage, which ends with that wonderful phrase popular during church stewardship drives, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, begins with what I believe could be the least motivational statement in a goal-driven culture such as ours. It is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This idea of the kingdom of God is often interpreted as some sort of goal. For some it is a good and blessed life. For others it is a more ultimate ideal heaven, eternal life. Yet as we read this statement, it seems clear that the gift of the kingdom is given by God at God's pleasure, not something to be earned. For my friends, let us be clear, there is nothing we can do to influence God. Further, biblical scholar Richard Carlson digs deeper into the Greek used in the text, and he points out that the language of the text demonstrates that this is a gift that has already been given. It makes use of a tense in Greek that conveys an accomplished action. So we are intended to understand from Jesus' statement that God already gave us the gift of the kingdom. It's ours already. Not something we must earn or not some goal to be accomplished. Think back a little bit to the great debates of the Christian faith, and this idea makes sense in light of the Apostle Paul's claims in the faith versus works debate. For the gifts of God are not earned, they are a gift of grace. All people have them, 
They but need to be acknowledged. The call then, later in the passage, to, quote, be ready is grounded in that gift of God. In essence, our faith encourages us to live lives not in pursuit of some eternal goal, but in light of this incredible gift. Because, friends, how can you seek to attain something that is already yours? There are those within our Christian faith who offer a message that is different from what I am suggesting. There are faithful Christians who believe that the things we do in life earn us the gifts of God. If we but pray better or give more joyfully, or if we more boldly denounce our sinful ways, then we will move and live more blessed lives. Perhaps even the blessedness of those lives will be measurable in tangible or financial terms. As I said, these are faithful people, and perhaps they might read this text and hear in it support for that perspective. And if that is what motivates them to live out their faith more boldly, then so be it. Whatever helps people see and do what is right cannot be bad. Yet I hear something different in Jesus' words. Take, for example, those servants awaiting the return of the head of the house in the scene Jesus describes. They are not blessed because they knew the head of the house was coming and they sprang into action getting all things ready. They are not blessed because they accomplished all the tasks on their to-do lists. It does not matter if they are planners or not, whether they finished early or if they just barely made the deadline. For the accomplishment is irrelevant. The servants are blessed because God has blessed them. They are faithful in what they do, and in the midst of living their lives, they did not earn special consideration because the house was tidy. Jesus' call to be ready then, as I hear it, is not a call to accomplish some kind of salvific checklist, but rather to live our lives informed by and inspired by God's gift of grace, to have faith in God's goodness, and to live in that light. This results in a way of life that is not so me-focused, that is concerned with the lives of others, a way of life that is invitational as we invite others to see and acknowledge the gifts of God. What then does that look like for us? Well, it looks exactly like what you think it looks. It looks like living boldly the ideals of our faith without reservations or hesitations. It looks like finding ways to house those who are homeless. It looks like feeding those who are hungry. It looks like giving water to those who are thirsty. It looks like caring for those who have lost a loved one or are experiencing pain or illness. It looks like spending time with those who feel isolated or alone. It looks like living in loving community with others, supporting one another as we all strive to form and to live out our faith. And it sounds like boldly speaking up for those without a voice and speaking out against injustice, calling for an end to discrimination in all its forms, calling for an even playing field for all people offering vocal support for people of all faiths to believe as they are led, screaming at the top of your lungs for an end to bullying and to gun violence in schools and in neighborhoods, and not just our schools and our neighborhoods, but all schools and all neighborhoods. It is a way of life that seeks to understand, not demonize the other, to celebrate not mock our differences. It is a way of life that seeks to engage those with whom we disagree, not condemn or disparage. It may sound cliche, especially here in a Christian church, but it is a way of life that asks the question, what would Jesus do, and then actually does it. We do not do this because it is politically correct based on someone's definition thereof. We do not do this because the preacher told us to. And we do not do this to earn God's love or to earn our place in the kingdom of God. For my friends, we already have that. 
We do this because it is who we are as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as people of God. It is who we are as individuals, and it is who we are as church. As we hear Jesus' call to be ready and we receive God's invitation to be prepared, let us not retreat to our to-do lists or begin to frantically attempt to tidy up our lives. Instead, let us be prepared by living our best lives boldly, assured of God's love and motivated to demonstrate that love in all that we say and all that we do. Amen. Pastors get unusual requests all the time. There was uh, a pastor who um, was visited by a woman who um, belonged to the church, was not terribly active, and she said, I've got a great favor to ask you. And he said, what is it? She said, well, I've got some unsettling news. My, my father has uh, won the lottery. He's won $50 million. And the pastor said, wow, well, why is that bad news? And she said, well, he's had a heart attack recently, and he's in the hospital, and we're afraid that if we tell him that he's won all this money, the strain's going to be too much, and it's, it's going to kill him. Pastor, and she said, well, as the pastor, maybe you can find a way to break it to him gently so it doesn't shock him. The pastor thought about it and said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. So he went to the hospital room and um, he said, I think I'll go about this roundabout way. So he said to the man, you know, how are you doing? And he said, I'm doing okay. You know, I was, I was wondering, just a hypothetical question. If, if you were to say, get $50 million all of a sudden, what do you suppose you'd do? The man thought about it for a minute and said, well, I think the first thing I'd do is I'd get half of it to the church. Well, the strain was too much for the pastor and he fell over dead. <laughs> As we worship God with our gifts and offerings, I would like to comfort you with the thought that both Mark and I are in very good cardiac health.
So am I correct that this is the first time the two of you have performed together? Is this... So, thank you. And I believe, Lily, you were telling me this is the first time you've performed since your soldier, so, shoulder, shoulder surgery. So it's so wonderful. Again, thank you so much. I invite you to join me in the prayer of dedication that is printed in your bulletin. The gifts we have received from you, O oh God, are bountiful, and they touch every aspect of our lives. We seek to be bold in our gratitude. Bless this offering given out of our abundance. May it embolden the ministries of this church as we seek to demonstrate your love in our life together. Amen. My friends, the good news of God is that we have God's love. We have been given God's grace. It is ours. We carry it with us wherever we go. Let us go from this place living our lives in light of that incredible gift. Sharing our love. Living our faith boldly in all aspects, in all days, in all places. Amen.